The presentation I'm going to give was something that developed over a few years of performing tours where I was able to see other surgeons perform operations as well, and I also teach fellows uh, in head and neck surgery, and I teach the fellows how to perform tours. And there's some lessons that I thought were very important for specifically for tours that may not apply to other specialties. And the reason is because we're taking three arms and we're putting them in one mouth. And so we have to manage collisions. And there's always a, um, a battle between the instrument arms and the space and your assistant. And so I felt like that I could share some of the uh, information, some pearls that I've learned uh, by performing tours that make tours uh, a better operation, a more delicate operation. Yesterday we saw many videos in the morning session and they were excellent videos and I think one thing about robotic surgery in all specialties that is different than previously is that every operation has a recording. Twenty years ago we only stood up here and we talked about surgery and we talked about our outcomes but nobody yet was able to watch us perform the surgery. They just had to believe that we knew how to perform the operation and we discussed our outcomes. Then we had laparoscopic surgery, but in head and neck there was no laparoscopic surgery, so still we had no recordings of our surgeries. Then there was transoral laser microsurgery, and maybe you would record your procedure, but still very little recording. But now with robotic surgery, every surgery is recorded. And so it makes us vulnerable as surgeons when we stand up here and we show our video to the audience because every person in the seat becomes a judge of our surgery, right? And I thought um, there is a lot of variation between tissue handling, et cetera. And you, we heard uh, a very good presentation yesterday about grading surgeries in order to improve the surgeon's skills and giving feedback about grading. So some of the lessons I'm going to share this morning are just things that I, that I learned over the years that I think may be helpful. So we start with a learning curve. Of course, as we improve and become a master at our skill, at our, at our profession, our skill set becomes uh, much more delicate, much more uh, uh, beautiful. If you watch the operation, there's finesse to the operation versus someone who's new in their, in, in their surgery skill set. It looks uh, very elementary, very basic. But, the, but the, uh, the learning curve is influenced not just by the surgeon, the individual surgeon and their ability to learn, but it's also influenced by the team that surrounds that surgeon so that if you have team members in your operating room who are also new and they're also novice, your learning curve is going to take a, sl a slower uh, um, uh, line than if you had a steep line with a team that was very experienced. The patient population is also quite important. So if you have a patient population where there are a lot of obese patients, you're going to have more difficult time with transoral surgery. And if you have a patient population who has more oral cavity, you may not have the opportunity to perform as much because really TORS is meant for the oropharynx and for the supraglottic larynx. The frequency of cases is important, so I learned in my learning curve that I reduced my surgery time by 50% after 40 cases. Time is not the only measure, but it's, a, it's the simple one to measure, and after 40 cases I was able to reduce my time. But that was based on a certain frequency and how often I did those cases. So if it, only, if it took me one case per month, maybe 40 months, versus ten, uh, four cases per month and it would take me 10 months, of course my learning curve is different. This was my ride to the resort on Friday morning. The drivers in India have certainly a learning curve, probably more difficult than the surgery than the, than the surgeons performing robotic surgery. Having to weave between all of the scooters and the buses and the trucks and the people walking and the cows crossing the street, uh, probably much more difficult than, than performing robotic surgery. So I mentioned case frequency. This was um, I, I published my learning curve uh, a few years ago, and so I looked at my first 160 cases, and I was able to show that even though month to month I was up or down and there was, no, um, uh, there was variability between the months, there was still a consistent increase in the number of cases performed month to month. And as I mentioned, my operative time was decreased by 50% at 40 cases. And then at, after 100 cases, really the surgical time, I mean, not the surgical time, the operative time, so that is 
The patient enters the room and the patient exits the room. It is now one hour. So a typical tours operation for me lasts one hour. The patient comes in the room, has their tours, and are out of the room within one hour. That means console time is probably around 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, docking time probably takes around 10 minutes. So the patient is in and out of the room in one hour. That influences the time for length of intubation. So when we first started the uh, procedures back in 2007, we kept the patients intubated overnight. There were a couple of reasons for that. One is we didn't know what would happen to the airway after the operation regarding bleeding. This was brand new. We were leaving a wound open. We were not closing our wounds, and we did not understand the risk of bleeding following a TORS operation. Now we have a better understanding. Additionally, when I first started, remember my surgeries were taking two hours or longer, and that's a long time to be under suspension with the mouth gag pressing against the tongue, and so we suffered from a lot of tongue swelling with those first operations, and so it was safer to keep the patient intubated to allow the tongue swelling to decrease. Now with the shorter operative times and also using perioperative steroids, we're able to extubate the patient every time in the operating room. Hospital length of stay is actually very important in the United States. We, we, uh, that is a metric that is kept by every hospital and every system and every um, uh, insurance company. And so we discharge patients quite quickly in the U.S. as a standard. I know that in other countries, patients are able to stay a little longer uh, with their surgeries. But for TORS, originally we were keeping the patients for at least two nights in the hospital, so a, a length of three days, two nights in the hospital. The first night was uh, originally in the intensive care unit. After we got more comfortable, we would, we would have them go directly from the recovery to a regular floor room. But now we just keep the patients in the hospital for one night. The patient has their surgery, spends the night in the hospital, and discharges the next day. So what I want to go over now in the rest of my presentation is we're going to go over the different components of TORS. So we'll begin with exposure. Docking, instrument movement, and we'll move on to tissue handling, vessel management, mar margin management, and then finally we'll put it all together. This was my view when I first arrived on Friday, the first time to Goa. I've, I've been to India before, but my first time here, very much like southern Florida, where I come from. So I felt very much at home. So exposure. I think that exposure is probably one of the most important, but yet maybe overlooked components to TORS. If you do not have the proper exposure, your operation will be extremely difficult. You will find it challenging, and I even worry that new surgeons who have trouble with exposure then find the operation challenging, they stop. They don't perform TORS. They think that it's not something that is, uh, is beneficial uh, in their practice. But if they had an easier time with the operation, maybe they would continue with TORS. So exposure is very important. You want to choose your patient correctly. So this should not be the patient you choose if you are beginning a TORS program. Only after you have significant num uh, number of patients and a significant amount of experience do you want to choose this patient. You see his head circumference is the same as his neck circumference. There is no plane difference between the chin, the neck, and the chest. It's all one plane. He has an enormous tongue. He has expensive dental work on the upper teeth. And it turned out, actually, in this patient, this is one of my patients, he had a base of tongue tumor, which even makes it more difficult because it's easier to perform a tonsillectomy than base of tongue, supraglottis, larynx, and hypopharynx. So the more distal you are in the aerodigestive tract, the more difficult the operation. There are some points that I think are quite important with docking, and I want to take a few minutes to discuss this right now, because we, we all know, those who are using TORS, we only use three arms of the machine. We don't use four arms. We use two instrument arms and one camera arm. And generally, I use a Maryland dissector and a spatula-tipped monopolar cautery. And then the camera is either a zero-degree camera or a 30-degree camera, and if we use it in the 30-degree, it's in the up position. I place the... Maryland dissector contralateral to the tumor. I place the Maryland dissector contralateral to the tumor in the monopolar cautery, ipsilateral. So that way I'm able to pull counter traction away from the tumor as I'm cutting. 
In these three illustrations, these three pictures, they all line up uh, vertically. So in the first picture, what I want to demonstrate, what I want to show is we have this variation where the, the arms are spread apart, they're coming to an apex, which is the working space, and you notice from the side view, the plane of the camera and all the arms are basically in the same plane. So using my own arms as a demonstration, the first set of pictures represents the setup for tonsillectomy. The next set of pictures represents the setup for base of tongue resection. And the last set of pictures represents the setup for supraglottic laryngectomy or resection of a piriform sinus tumor. And so my description is like this. If we're performing our own surgery, the robot is really just an extension of our own bodies, right? So if we're performing our own surgery and we're doing tonsillectomy, we're coming straight down and our arms are pretty much outward in this direction. And then imagine I have to go to the tongue base. And so I come back a little bit and my arms are go now coming a little closer together as I'm reaching to the tongue base. And now I want to go down to the larynx or the piriform sinus. I sit back even more and my arms are coming closer together as I'm working down in that space. So the more distal we get in the aerodigestive tract, the closer the arms become. It's really important to understand that because as you get distal in the airway, we are then faced with significant collision possibilities when we're working in this setting. But the other thing I want you to know is once I've gone from this to the base of tongue or, or to the superglottis, I've had to change the camera because here the zero degree camera and the instruments are all relatively on the same plane. But as the arms come closer together, there is not room for the camera. So we now have to switch to a 30 degree up facing camera and the camera and the arms are placed at different planes. So now the camera is more vertical and the arms become more horizontal. And the more distal you get in the airway, the more horizontal these arms become, the camera remains essentially nearly vertical. This allows for the only collision opportunity may be between these two arms and the camera is out of the way. So you don't have to worry about the collision opportunity and adding another uh, instrument or another uh, arm. So considering these arms, these arms are going to be moving during the operation. If you've ever watched what's happening at the patient side, with the patient side cart, whatever you're doing with your hands is being transferred to a movement at the patient side cart. Now these instruments can be uh, manipulated in a couple of different ways. You have the end of the instrument, which is, um, has the joints and you can, remove, you can move the tip of the instrument, or you can use the instrument as a straight stick, very much like laparoscopic. However, if you use it as a straight stick, I'm gonna show you what happens at the bedside. So here's a demonstration of what I call the straight stick method and the, the fine movements of the instrument tip only. Here on the top is the straight stick method. On the bottom is the instrument tip movement only. And I want you to see what happens at the patient side, at the, with a patient cart. I actually find when, when teaching surgeons and watching surgeons and even watching all of our videos that we share, Many of the surgeons default to this type of movement of the instrument. And I'll say if you're, if you're moving this, it's not necessarily wrong, but you're not taking advantage of the wristed end of the instrument. But look what's happening. As I'm moving, outlining this, what I drew as a tonsil, and I'm using this more as a laparoscopic straight stick, look what's happening to the instrument at, at the patient's side. And this is what's happening here. If you look, the key is the movement of my wrist. So if I'm using my wrist to move the instrument, it's really more like a straight stick movement. Now, how do we decrease the movement at the patient side? What we do is, you see there's no movement, very quiet at the patient side, yet I'm able to trace the outline the same as I trace this outline. 
But what is the difference now? Look at my wrist. My wrist is still and very quiet, and the movement is only happening at my fingers. We don't have the big um, range of motion that is seen with the pelvis or the abdomen, where they're able to make big movements within their operative field. We have a very limited space where we can move. And so we have to take advantage of the wristed end of this instrument. And so if my wrist is still and I'm moving just with my fingers, I'm still able to trace out that short distance of, of the tonsil. The other thing I want to point out, when placing your hands in the master controls, it's designed so that you put your fingers in the stirrups, in the strips, the Velcro strips. I'm going to ask if you place your hands or your fingers outside of those strips. The reason is, if we're trying to be very small in our movement and keep our wrist still, many times you're going to have to flip your instrument. I'll show you the use of my Maryland dissector, what I do with it, and I'm rotating it 180 degrees, whatever gives me the best advantage. If you have your fingers inside the strips and you're rotating, your wrist is rotating. But if you keep your fingers out and you, and you spin the master control in your hand, your wrist stays quiet. So the master control will turn and you're able to turn it, but you don't have to turn your wrist to do so. This is just um, more examples, more illustrations of the same. So the top row is similar of using a straight stick and you see the movement of the instrument at the patient side and then you see the movement of the instrument uh, if you're only using the wristed end of the instrument. Why is this important? Because remember the, the, this picture here. Imagine when you're working here and if those arms are moving at the patient side, you're gonna collide. The tabs on the instruments are gonna touch. Has this happened to you? All of a sudden you're moving your instrument but you're trying to make it go this way and the instrument goes the opposite way. That's because the tab has, has been hit at the, on the cart. You have to take the whole instrument out, you have to put it back in, reset it, and go again. So if you're having big movements at the patient side, those tabs are gonna hit. There is no space right here to have all of that movement. You must use your fingers and keep your wrists quiet. Tissue handling. I'll run all of these, they're on a loop so we can take time and look at them. I mentioned yesterday, I use the Maryland dissector exclusively. I don't use a ProGrasp and, and the other instruments uh, um, for the tissue dissection part. I like the Marylands a lot because they're exactly like the hemostat that we use in open surgery. And the, and the Maryland can be used not only as a grasper, but it can be used as a retractor. And you can see what I'm doing here. I have the Maryland tines open. This is a tongue-based operation and I'm pushing the tissue down so I can work up. I'm using my tines open to push down. I'm not grasping and crushing the tissue. That's really gonna hurt my margin evaluation for my pathologist. It's also gonna bleed more. It's gonna fracture and it will tear up. So I'm using my instrument as a, re a retractor, almost like a rake. Again, I'm doing the same thing here. I'm more uh, distal in my dissection there's a lot more tissue here, and this. So one, the other thing I want to point out, look how I'm using the whole instrument now to push. I, I call this, we teach our children not to put the elbows on the table when they're eating. But when we're operating, we want to take advantage and we can put the elbow of that instrument on the tissue and that give us more of the instrument to retract and push the tissue away. We have this big tongue tissue that wants to just push up into our view. We want to keep it out of our view. So I'm using that edge of the instrument. Vessel management. Yesterday there was an excellent video and I congratulate the surgeon to talk about vessel management. And I, and I will say, despite, I'm going to pause this for a second, despite the experience level, everybody will, ha will encounter a bleeding vessel. I find myself doing some very challenging cases now because I feel like I can offer the operation to the patient. I'm operating very close to the internal carotid artery. I don't have it during this uh, conference, but if you want to talk about parapharyngeal space tumors,
if it's a sympathetic chain parapharyngeal space tumor, the internal carotid is sitting on top of the tumor if you're coming transorally. So imagine having to dissect the internal carotid off of the tumor, getting underneath the internal carotid and, and delivering the tumor. If you're removing a pleomorphic adenoma, the internal carotid artery is underneath the tumor. So now when you're dissecting underneath the tumor, you're blindly dissecting on the internal carotid artery. Imagine the danger there. But when we're doing more challenging tongue-based cancers that move laterally into the peripheral space and neck, or tonsil tumors that are going beyond the buccal pharyngeal fascia and you're still dissecting off the external carotid artery and its branches, you will encounter bleeding. Yesterday, a point was made about placement of clips, and I want to use this video to demonstrate what, what I'll call the proper placement. I'm going to enter, or I'm going to uh, perforate the lingual artery in this operation. You'll see it begin to bleed. So the lingual artery is often in the upper outer quadrant. So I'm using my Marilyn's to push away. I'm coming up here and I'm working superiorly. I'm going to um, cause an injury to the lingual artery. So here we are. You see the bleeding here coming off the lingual artery. It's beginning to shoot around. I've lost my opportunity to look at the tissue because as I let go, the artery became covered by the muscle. Bleeding is going around. And I'll tell you, as a, as a robotic surgeon, your initial reaction is to step away from the console and rush to the patient's side. That's a mistake. If this was an open operation, what would you do? You would take your hemostat, you would occlude the vessel, stop the bleeding, then you would dissect the vessel out, place some clips or place some ties around it, divide the vessel, and continue on with your operation. You have to do the same thing here. You can't allow the bleeding to continue. You have to see, and sometimes, I think there was someone yesterday who said, I will let the bleeding happen on purpose so I can see where it's coming from. And so, in this case, now I'm taking my Maryland and I'm pinching the Maryland across the vessel to tamponade the bleeding. Now I'm using my monopolar cautery to bluntly dissect and cut some tissue that's on either side of the vessel so that now the vessel is perfectly presented to my assistant. There's no bleeding. We know exactly where to place the clips. I put multiple clips on the feeding side and just one clip that's going to be on the tissue or the tumor side, and now I can continue on with a bloodless operation. So that's the way to manage it. Do not leave the console to go to the patient side. There can be some other tips. You can, give, you can have an assistant give external pressure. That can tamponade or at least slow down some of the bleeding if the bleeding is coming out quickly. You can... Um, have your assistant get in there with two suctions. If, you're, if the blood is coming out faster than what you can evacuate, get two suctions in there. Remember, your assistant has two instruments. And I use the Yankauer suctions, the, the metal pediatric Yankauer suctions. They have a nice curve so that the assistant can work around the instruments, and then they, they're rigid enough that they can also retract. Here's an operation that I've already finished. I've taken the, the tongue-based specimen out, and what am I doing? I'm inspecting the wound. That's very important afterwards, because if you don't inspect the wound, you may overlook a vessel that may be under some spasm, and so it's not bleeding at the moment, but as soon as the patient relaxes, within 24 hours, you will be back to the operating room managing a bleed. If you leave a vessel exposed and there's not enough tissue covering the vessel, you'll be back to the operating room six days later with a bleed. The saliva around the wound, the saliva within the wound will erode into the vessel. You'll have a rupture and, and hopefully it's not catastrophic. Usually by six days, the patient's home. If they have a major bleed from a lingual branch or the lingual artery itself, they will not survive. They will not see you in the operating room. So very important to inspect the wound when you're done and manage the vessels if necessary. So I'm looking at the pulse of the lingual artery here and assessing whether I need to place some clips.
What can I teach you about post-operative hemorrhage and how to avoid a catastrophic bleed? This was a lesson, a personal lesson that I had. I wrote an article uh, a couple of years ago looking at um, what, what I could learn from my own experience in terms of bleeds. Which patients would bleed? How can I reduce any bleeds, et cetera? And uh, around 150, just a few shy of 150 cases we reviewed, we found 11 bleeds. And of those 11 bleeds, most of those bleeds were minor, just some oozing from the granulation bed within the wound, and we were able to control those just with some simple cautery. But there were a couple of patients that had major bleeds, and especially I'll point out number 10, patient number 10. I'll tell you the story. Remember my operation time is less than one hour. That's because I separate my neck dissection from the TORS operation. That is simply a matter of efficiency. I can perform TORS and neck dissection in the same day, but when I do, I can't do as many TORS operations in one day because the instrument setups are completely different and while the patient is, uh, while, while the room is being turned over between a, the robotic portion and the neck dissection, there's about 30 to 45 minutes of downtime where the patient is just under general anesthetic and nothing is happening. So I set up my tours, multiple tours for one day. I do the neck dissections in a separate, separate um, operation. Originally, I was doing the tours first and the neck dissection second until patient number 10. Patient number 10 had a uh, TORS base of tongue resection, and one week later, seven days later, we were then going to perform the neck dissection. I said, on day six, your patients may have a bleed. Well, certainly, this happened to him. He was at home. He had a sudden um, hemorrhage come from his mouth, lost consciousness. His wife describes a pool of blood on the kitchen floor. She called the emergency service. They came. Miraculously, I'm not sure how they were able to intubate him, but congratulations. They placed a bunch of gauze in his mouth. They flew him on a helicopter to my hospital in the middle of the night. And at 3 or 4 a.m., on the day that he was going to have his neck dissection, he had his neck dissection. But it wasn't scheduled for 8 o'clock. I was doing it as an emergency at 3 a.m. I performed the neck dissection. While I was doing the neck dissection, I was finished. I dissected out the, the uh, external carotid. I saw the lingual artery. I went ahead and ligated the lingual artery. We then went into the mouth, removed the gauze, and the, and the pharynx was completely dry. Ligating the lingual artery was the source, uh, was, ligating the lingual artery was able to control the source of the bleeding. I was discussing this with some of my colleagues, and um, someone said, why don't you do your neck dissection first? If you're going to separate them, do your neck dissection first. Ligate the lingual for the base of tongue, the facial for the tonsil, so that the next week when you do the tours, you may have some bleeding, but you're not going to have the risk of that catastrophic bleed. And so that's when I changed my practice pattern. And as a matter of fact, this paper led to the recommendation. So if you follow the clinical trials in the US, there was ECOG 3311. It's a de-escalation trial. Every patient had TOR surgery, and then they were followed by adjuvant treatment, and it, there was a de-escalation de arm. I was part of that trial um, de, uh, creation, and I was part of the safety um, uh, committee. And it was, it was mandatory for any surgeon who is on that trial that they perform a ligation of the lingual and facial artery for every patient. That was mandatory. You could not enroll a patient if you did not ligate the lingual and the facial artery. The reason? To avoid a catastrophic bleed. Now, you still have some bleeding. You'll have contralateral flow um, coming from the opposite side. There's, there's excellent vascular flow coming from the opposite side. You'll have bleeding from the granulation tissue, but it won't be catastrophic. At least that's what we've seen so far. How do I manage margins? So. Um, the concepts of TORS is that we perform on-block resection. It is very different than TLM. TLM is almost like doing Mohs surgery within the, within the aerodigestive tract. They intentionally cut through tumor with a laser until they see that they've gone through the other side of the tumor into normal tissue, and they take it out in pieces. They have to map it. It's very technically difficult. It's difficult for both the surgeon and for the pathologist to understand the orientation.
But in TOR surgery, we teach an en bloc resection. But what happens if you're operating, I'm coming on this, excuse me, tongue-based tumor, and I see that I've entered the tumor. You can, you can see that you see some keratin, et cetera, when you're entering the tumor. Well, if that's the case, I'm not going to continue to cut through the tumor and then come back and get a margin. Why? It's still attached. So here, I back up. And I start, I start taking a new margin. I come, I come back to my original anterior incision. I make a new anterior incision. And I start taking this. And it's almost, this is almost like now a blanket or a covering. That's really the true margin. So when I go to the pathologist, here's the tumor. And there's this piece of tissue that's coming up. Well, this is not the margin. I tell my pathologist, this is where I saw I cut to the tumor. So I backed up and I went and made a new margin. I left it attached so he can see how it's lying down. And he checks this as my margin. So I call that real-time management of the margins. The other things that I do once I get the tumor out, I do take some margins from the patient as well. So while the pathologist is looking at the primary specimen that I removed, I don't want to just waste my time. It, I, I've already grossly inspected the tumor, and I get some idea that, hey, I think this lateral margin is close. I'll let the pathologist look at that, but while he's looking at that, I'm going to continue working, and I'm going to take a new lateral margin. He will call me and say, your margin's positive. Well, I already have my new margin here. Look at this one. When you take the new margin, make sure that you ink or mark the new cut side, because when you have a new margin, there are two cut sides, right? And he doesn't know what side he's looking at. You have to mark the side that's the new cut side. Or he'll call back and say, your margin's negative. It's close, but it's negative. And I say, well, listen, I've got another specimen, a new margin in that spot. I'm going to send it to you as a permanent. We don't need to freeze it. So that when I get my permanent pathology, he knows specimen, my margin was one millimeter. But taking into account the new margin taken from the lateral edge, another four millimeters, I have five millimeters of margin, okay? So that's how I manage those margins. There's another advantage of doing your neck dissection first. When I was doing the TORS first, I did have some patients with hypoglossal nerve injury on the tongue base resections. That's because when you're getting out into that tongue base and you're getting close to the hyoid, you're getting very close to, to the uh, hypoglossal nerve. And so I'd have the patients come back and they have significant weakness to that side of their tongue. When I started doing the neck dissections first, after I'm finished with the neck dissection, I palpate manually, digitally, at the tongue base, up into the peripharyngeal space where the tonsil is located. And I see how close is this tumor to my margin out here. So this, in this case, the hypoglossal nerve is coming along the tongue base, and I palpate right here, and I, and I feel that tumor is very close to my hypoglossal nerve, so that when I come back the next week, I'm going to injure that nerve. There's no way that I can avoid injuring that nerve unless I help myself out. So what I do is I take, this is, um, uh, we call it in the U.S., the brand name is called Alloderm. It's an acellular dermal matrix of tissue. In this case, we use human, but there is also porcine available, depending. But I, but I like the human tissue. It, all the cells have been removed. It's just the proteins in the dermal matrix. And I put it, this is a thick piece. It's about probably around two millimeters thick. And I lay it between the tumor. I hold it in place with a couple of stitches. And I lay it between the tumor and the hypoglossal nerve. So. What happens when I go back the next week and I perform my TORS resection? I don't run into the hypoglossal nerve. I run into my alloderm. And I know that that's a nice clean margin around there, and I'm going to keep the nerve protected. And here is the exact same patient that you just saw the neck dissection. I'm coming laterally, and, and here is my alloderm. And I know I can safely come across that alloderm. I can actually go fairly quickly across that alloderm because I know my hypoglossal nerve is on the other side, it's safe, and I know that that margin's clear because I palpated it the week before. You can do the same thing for the internal carotid artery. 
you palpate your, in the peripharyngeal space behind the tonsil, you find the tonsil, is, the cancer is extremely close to the internal carotid artery. Well, place the alloderm between the internal carotid artery and the tumor so that the next week when you come back, that artery is protected, not only from you injuring it during the surgery, but it's also covered during the healing process, during the secondary intention. You don't want to leave an artery that's uncovered. So I've also covered it, so now it's protected from any uh, unexpected rupture. Specimen orientation. I've taken out a relatively, uh, a, probably a T2 tongue based tumor, but my specimen size is pretty big. I'll tell you, when you are operating on these tongue based tumors, your specimen starts to spin and twist. And when you put it on the back table, you don't know what is the right side, what is the midline, what is anterior, what is, po you, you don't know anymore because the specimen spun around. So before I remove it, I replace it back in its anatomical uh, location, just like a puzzle piece. I put it back into its spot. I grab it at a known edge. So in this case, I'm grabbing the anterior margin. When I take it out, I, my insistent knows to grasp it exactly where I'm holding it. It goes to the table, and the first thing, we put a stitch in that spot. So now we know the orientation of that margin. You'll have a lot of um, trouble if you don't orient the margin before coming out. Don't come out. Your assistant grabs wherever they want to grab and puts it on the back table, and you've lost your orientation. So putting it all together. So this is a radical tonsillectomy. And you'll see some of the tips that I just um, spoke about. So in this case, again, as an on block resection, the superior margin is at the soft palate. So I, I start superiorly first. Some people start laterally. It doesn't matter. If you're taking out the box, it doesn't matter where you start. So I cut through the, superior, the palate and the constrictor muscles until I see the peripharyngeal fat. Next, I follow the pterygomandibular raphe, and I see the, me the medial pterygoid muscle, the, the, the um, medial uh, side of that muscle. I'm detaching it from the uh, tongue base. You have to be very careful in this area because you see here, this is the submandibular gland and the lingual nerve is coming right across this into the tongue, exiting the mandible across the submandibular gland into the tongue. So you have to be careful not to injure the nerve in that location. Notice I'm doing blunt dissection. I'm pushing this direction laterally because those are my great vessels are underneath that fat. I want to keep that fat on top of the great vessels. You see here, this is the styloglossus muscle. I've already divided it at the tongue base. I will divide it again superiorly in a moment. I'm cutting through the glossopharyngeal nerve here. That provides sensation to the oropharynx. There's no harm in, in cutting that nerve. I'll finally cut through the styloglossus muscle and, and continue to work on. We'll see a blood vessel here will come through. I've had a, a vein. I'm dissecting underneath the vein. Here's, this is now the stylopharyngeus muscle. I'm cutting along my posterior margin or my medial margin. I'm going to get to the vein on the other end. I'll, it's too large for just simply cauterizing, so I'll put clips on the other end. You'll see that here in a minute. This is the vein here. Small little vessels. Um, it's not recommended to cauterize in that way, but I find it very useful. So now I'm getting the vein. Again, there was a point made. The best way to avoid a complication is to not have a complication and just to dissect out before you cut through. So my assistant is placing clips. I like to use multiple clips on the side that is going to remain with the patient. If a clip falls off, you have some um, backup. Make the final cut through the stylopharyngeus muscle here. And then the final cuts will be made along the posterior pharyngeal wall. And my specimen is removed. I take, I orient, you see here, I had the, I grabbed the superior margin. My assistant grabbed it exactly where I was holding. Now I go back in and I inspect the wound. I look for pulsation. If I saw that the carotid was exposed, 
How do I cover it? I have two options. One is I can make an incision in the buccal mucosa and turn down a buccal uh, fat pad, leaving it attached posteriorly in the mouth, but rotating it into the pharynx and then attaching it to the posterior pharyngeal wall. It's a nice vascularized fat pad to cover the carotid. Or I can dissect out the longest coli muscle, elevate the mucosa off the posterior pharyngeal wall, make three cuts on the longest coli muscle, a superior, an inferior, and a medial cut, and then turn that longest coli muscle up over the carotid artery and secure it in place. Many times I'll secure it to the pterygoid muscle. It's nice tissue. And now you've got a muscle covering with some fascia, as a matter of fact, covering the carotid. So thank you for your attention. I, I will let you know, um, for those who like to travel to Orlando, the weather is very similar to what we have here. Um, this is our training facility. I'm the chief medical officer for this training facility, and we train up to 15,000 learners annually, so not all surgeons. We train lay people as well as nurses, et cetera. But I do have a five-day TORS training course that I've talked to some of you about, so if you'd like to come, it's, a, it's an excellent course for five days. It includes lectures, uh, observations, simulation training, cadaver dissection, and here are two of the surgeons. Japan is coming up quickly, 2018. Their FDA will approve tours in that country. And so here are a couple of surgeons uh, who had a head start. Uh, Professor Amori is now in Kyoto. And then those of you who are interested in sleep apnea, I'm not a sleep apnea surgeon, although I can perform tongue-based reduction simply with tours. But Claudio Vicini is the world expert on tours for sleep apnea, and he and I uh, direct a sleep apnea course annually. We'll have our, our fifth international course the end of February in Orlando, and if you'd like to come, the, the uh, content and faculty are excellent. Thank you very much.